I'm here to explore something that's going on in your head, but you may not be aware of it. I think there's a drama going on. And this drama has been going on since the year dot. This relationship we have between our home at all scales, from the image that you have of a tree outside your bedroom window, all the way through to the planet that we call our home, there's a drama going on between the forces that are attempting to create and the forces that are attempting to destroy. And this is a very old drama, and I want to give this old drama some new ideas, some new thoughts, and this is a, a good forum to test them out. Tipping points in the mind. We talk about tipping points in climate change and other areas of uh, large-scale ecosystem assessment, but when in, uh, w what's really happening is that within our own minds, there are tipping points about these forces of uh, destruction and forces of creation going on all the time. And if we're going to solve many of these globally significant environmental problems, if we're going to solve them at national or even local levels, we're going to have to sort out what's going on in our heads. Kate McDowell has uh, produced this artwork and it was featured in a New York Times magazine article on eco-psychology earlier this year. And this idea that there may be a koala sitting inside our heads uh, asking questions of us about urban growth, urban development, pushing into koala habitat, where are koalas going? That's symbolic of the stress, the tensions that are going on within us all, all of the time. And this drama is unfolding in the 21st century at a pace and scale that we've never seen before. We now have globally significant factors driving change on this planet. In the past, as a uh, patch-disturbing species, we've been able to disturb a patch and move on. Now the patch is the whole planet, and although some of us are thinking about moving on to other planets, I think right now in our heads we're thinking about, let's sort this one out first. The old dramas. I believe we have a bishop in the audience who's dealt with heaven and hell. Hell is one of those concepts that's really interesting. At least it's earthbound. We are in the earth and we're burning because of the sins that we've committed uh, for some reason. Heaven's more difficult to understand. It's somehow beyond this earth uh, and this otherworldliness is a place where uh, redemption is gained and where human beings can have uh, sin alleviated. However, it's this earth right here and now where we have a major issue and it's this earth where we have to develop our concepts and our ideas to help tip the tipping point towards the creativity, uh, the building, rather than allow us to fall apart into some sort, of, some sort of chaos and destruction. We have lots of concepts in our language that help us do this. Love and strife are, in the ancient Greek worlds, uh, forces that are driving us one way or the other. Love has been appropriated by the advertising world, so it's no longer all that useful in sorting out these cosmic dramas between uh, the forces of good and the forces of evil. Good and evil themselves have been appropriated by all sorts of traditions, uh, many of which use good and evil interchangeably. The, f uh, the fight between good and evil is now connected to global political ideologies as well. Uh, and we talk about the end of history and those sorts of things. So an another drama that's important, but one that we no longer find all that useful. Freud talked about Eros and Thanatos, uh, the life-creating and the death-creating forces. Uh, Freud himself didn't talk about Thanatos all that much, and it doesn't seem to be a word that's caught on much in the language. We don't analyse the destruction of society or all ecosystems using the concept of Thanatos. A very useful addition was biophilia from the famous biologist E.O. Wilson. Biophilia, Wilson defined as a, a, almost an instinctual, genetically based affiliation uh, and attraction towards other life forms. Necrophilia, by contrast, is the attraction towards those forces which create death and destruction. Biophilia, I'd love it to be a, a major factor in human affairs in the early 21st century. But if it's hardwired, it must be weak because the forces that are destroying seem to be far outweighing the biophilia, the forces which are 
hardwired in us to create. So it looks like we need something else. We need some culturally uh, acquired or culturally transmitted force power concept which is going to do more than what biophilia is doing right now. So this drama that's going on in your heads can end in tragedy. Cobb in 1966 uh, presented us with the apocalypse after perhaps the nuclear Armageddon. They were the issues that in the 60s were really uh, important uh, in uh, maintaining our attention on this big drama that's going on between the forces of creation and destruction. It's been going on much longer than that. Munch in 1893, not long after the explosion of Krakatoa, uh, having seen the uh, amazing uh, sunsets and dawns that were occurring worldwide, thought that this was perhaps a, uh, a, a foretelling of the apocalypse. And so we have this famous image which uh, has been stolen and acquired by someone else now. So I'm interested in this relationship between humans, their built environment, the natural environment, and their psychological states. And it's very interesting that there are very few concepts in the English language that enable us to think about these relationships. They're vital. Our relationship to our home environment is one of the most important relationships that we have in our whole existence, and yet our language is somewhat impoverished when it comes to explaining that relationship, particularly when it's threatened. So I've started to develop a typology of what I call psychotoratic diseases. So psychotoratic, it's not in the dictionary, but it's earth-related mental health issues. So if your home environment is being violated, desolated, uh, or in some way altered that you find negative or distressing, then it falls into a psychotoratic category. Equally, I could come up with a typology of psychotoratic disorders that are uh, not disorders, uh, uh, things that are actually very positive. And so the, the rest of my talk will look at this drama between these forces of creation and the forces of destruction through this concept of psychotoratic diseases. So we have now, under global climate change and global development forces, anxiety about what's happening. So we can talk about eco-anxiety as a first level response to the stressors that are happening to our, uh, our natural environment and, uh, and loved built environments. Richard Louv talks about nature deficit disorder in our children. I think about that same problem as uh, artifact overload disorder in adults who are so uh, infatuated with technology and artifacts that they fail to take their children into the woods or into nature. Ecoparalysis is when you've got so much information coming in about the negatives about the environment that there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Most of you know that changing the light bulbs is not sufficient to address the problem of global warming. I've created the concept of solastalgia, which I'll define and say something more about shortly, but it is a new form of psychotoratic disease, or newly defined, but one that I think humans have experienced uh, for a great deal of their history. The concept of nostalgia is a psychotoratic concept. It, when it was created, it meant the kind of homesickness and melancholia that people feel when they're absent from home and wish to return. So particularly afflicted uh, soldiers fighting on foreign shores, these soldiers would become homesick. The only cure for nostalgia was to send them back home again, to repatriate them. And this repatriation would be part of the healing process. They would be healed and then sent back to the front only to be killed. So eco-nostalgia in the 21st century will be where our uh, Arctic landscape, for example, just disappears and people who have been away and then come back to it find that it's no longer there, the melting of the permafrost and that sort of thing. And global dread, this issue that uh, when you wake up in the morning and hear Radio National telling you that there's uh, a giant iceberg that's just fallen off the uh, Antarctic uh, landmass, uh, it's uh, going to raise the sea level by four metres and uh, cause massive problems worldwide. It's the sort of feeling that you have when the news is all bad. So the new drama is between what I call solastalgia, this idea that you lose solace in your home environment. You feel desolated about the loss of a loved home environment. You feel isolated and powerless in the face of forces that are creating this kind of destruction. What sort of forces? Well, 
with my colleagues Linda Connor, who's Professor of Anthropology at Sydney University, and Nick Higginbotham, who's Associate Professor of Social Psychology at Newcastle University, we've engaged in study of people who have been affected by large-scale mining in the Upper Hunter and power station fallout. So that's one sort of an, of an example. Others, I've had people ask me, can they study their solastalgia uh, with wind turbines on the Flurio Peninsula in South Australia? Peri-urban chicken farms on the outskirts of Brisbane. Airport noise around Sydney. These people are all experiencing change to their environment that they find negative. It's a lived experience of that change. It's not nostalgia. And solophilia has been created by me this year to really describe the opposite of solastalgia, a new philia that's needed in our culture and our politics to return solace, to give us a sense of the unity or the solidarity that's needed to oppose the forces that are destroying life and life processes. So solastalgia, the short definition, is the homesickness you have when you're still at home. It's an emplaced feeling. You feel dislocated, but you haven't gone anywhere. If you've got a massive industry like open-cut coal mining in the Upper Hunter, it literally undermines your territory, your space, your home, and takes it away. If you're experiencing the leading edge of climate change, you're also having uh, your home environment move away from you. You've gone nowhere. You've been perfectly good, but your home's packed up and gone somewhere else. It's heading south if you're in the southern hemisphere, and it's heading north if you're in the northern hemisphere. Alan Chilner and I went up in a helicopter in, in 2008 and had a look at the transformation of the Upper Hunter. And it's being transformed bucket load by bucket load from a place that was once called the Tuscany of the South to a massive over 500 square kilometres open cut coal mine feeding the power stations of the Upper Hunter and delivering the energy that we all enjoy. Some of the biggest machines in the world transform the landscape in a, at a scale and at a pace that is unbelievable unless you take the time to go up there and have a look. The research team has interviewed people who live next door to these mines. That's Rix's Creek and this woman who was interviewed, a woman in her 70s, uh, I won't read it out, but she was expressing her pr most profound distress at what was happening to her home environment. And she said she was a real mess. And this is something that came across often in the interviews, that people were um, extremely emotional about the fact that their loved home environment was being destroyed by forces that they had no control over. This was an indigenous man who was talking about uh, the area around Musselbrook in the Upper Hunter, which is now ringed by open-cut coal mines. That's Bengala open-cut, and in the middle of it is one of the world's largest machine, an electric shovel or drag line. He, this scene makes him so wild, quote unquote, that he has to drive hundreds of extra kilometres to avoid looking at what had, what's happened to the landscape, a landscape that one of the local mayors called a lunar landscape. So in order to defeat that kind of solastalgia, in order to turn it around, we need a new meme. And the meme I've created is solophilia. Solophilia is the love of the totality of our place relationships and a willingness to accept in solidarity and in affiliation with others, the political responsibility for the health of our home, the earth. And it could be at smaller scales as well. Kate McDowell has produced this piece, which was also featured in the New York Times Magazine article, and she called it solophilia. And it exemplifies that uh, desire, that movement towards uh, affirming life, to build life rather than to destroy it. So we have this situation where he, this drama that's going on in your head, at least I think it is, is either going to end in tragedy or triumph. We could have a pandemic of solastalgia as the climate gets trashed. We could have a pandemic of solastalgia as the forces of development continue to overtake every square uh, metre of the earth. Or we could have a pandemic of solophilia where the, the love of the earth, the solidarity that can come out between human beings to save it, is something that uh, will constitute a triumph. I wanted to end on this photo, but I won't, because these are the people of the Liverpool Plains at Karuna. They 
engaged in solophilia. They collaborated. Their cows, their dogs, their babies all came together and they're op uh, opposing the long wall mining of the Liverpool Plains, one of the most fertile areas of agriculture in the whole of Eastern Australia. However, they won in the courts. They've been fighting for years. They've blockaded their farms to try and keep agriculture life forces going. But the, sta uh, the state governments just trump them with a new law that says that you can go ahead and mine this most fertile place. So we have to go back to the previous slide. We are still in danger, even in New South Wales, of having this pandemic of solastalgia. The people of the Upper Hunter just had one victory, which was the cessation of the attempt to uh, mine at uh, a place called Bickham, the only time an open-cut coal mine has been refused in New South Wales. I think we need a pandemic of solophilia, and I would encourage the TED audience and the rest of New South Wales to make sure that uh, we, we go in that direction and not in the direction of a pandemic of solastalgia.